we're glad that you are with us, even though we can't see you right now. And uh, we're thankful for the age of telecommunications, when people who, for one reason or another, are not able to uproot and uh, uh, get to this place, they can stay where they are, and we, through these beautiful devices, can take what we're doing uh, to them. And uh, I hope that you, will, in the class here, will really feel a part with them. And uh, I hope that you will ask uh, questions that they might think of asking and perhaps won't be able to ask, at least not ask here. Uh, don't let the cameras intimidate you. Uh, don't be afraid that you'll make a mistake or say something wrong. Uh, we can, uh, for one thing, we can edit all of that out. <laughs> this, uh, this is not live. Uh, but they want the benefit of your participation. Knowing that the cameras are on, you'll probably want to stay awake in class. Uh, for we might just make a whole scene of you if you don't. Uh, so you want to be with us. But uh, we are glad that last year we had, last quarter we had seven centers, and this quarter we go into 22 centers. And it may be 50 centers next quarter. And uh, who knows what we'll have 100 centers in the fall. And I'd like to get such a broad sweep here in this country that uh, we could take it to developing countries for little of nothing. And I think if we could spread the training far enough and get a broad enough financial base in America where dollars are a little easier to come by, believe it or not, uh, we might be able to do something overseas in places like Indonesia, and other outlets, the Philippines, where people just really have it tough. And uh, may I just make a little exhortation here along the line that um, because we hear of financial cutbacks and a lot of other things, some of us really have it, think we have it tough. And maybe a very small portion really do, but believe me, most of us are wealthy. Most of you are wealthy when compared with a world situation. I'll never forget teaching in the Philippines and coming across a pastor who had moved in from the rural area to the urban area so he could go to Asian Theological Seminary. He had not had the opportunity of training and he desperately wanted it. And uh, he left a very flourishing pastorate in a, in a uh, rural area to come to that city area, and uh, really was working hard at developing a successful church from the best sense of that term. And uh, he started his calling day at 6 o'clock in the morning because he found he couldn't find anybody home later. And so he would go, and people were getting up, and he'd get there at 6 o'clock in the morning, have coffee with one family, race on to the next family. He could get three or four families before they all got off to work. And then once they all went to work, they went back to the church and started having Bible classes there, had a couple of them a day for people that could come to the church. And he ended his calling program by late in the evening. And that was a typical day for him. And he tried to get study in between that. And uh, I went and looked at his library, and he really had uh, nothing there. And uh, he said, I, I would so like to get a hold of the Greek. And, and uh, learn that and be able to do word studies and uh, really open up the word in such a way that it would feed people. And I said, well, do you know Greek yet? No, I said, he didn't know Greek. I said, well, there's a book that you can use. It's called Vine's Expository Dictionary of Words. And for an English reader who wants to use the value of the Greek, there is much to be gained there. And I told him some of the things you could do with Vine's Expository Dictionary of Words. And he got so excited about that and getting that book, and he said, uh, oh, wow, I'd like to have that. How much would it cost? And I said, well, it's, it's uh, minimal. It's fifteen ninety-five. dollars And uh, he went on to show me around the church and so forth and just dropped the subject. And I said, hey, what's, uh, what about this book? Oh, he says, I couldn't save enough in the rest of my ministry to buy that. Uh, we came back here, and we started a book drive, and we sent several thousand dollars worth of books to pastors in the Philippines include a lot of copies of Vine's Expository Dictionary of Words. <laughs> but uh, 
I, I want to say that there is a tendency in America today to do a lot of poor mouthing and to talk about how hard we've got it. And just let me tell you, we haven't got it hard. We're blessed. And we need to understand that. God may put us to the wall to make us readjust some of our priorities. And we want to accept that because God is good and he only does good things to us. So uh, in the course of this course, we want to praise God for his goodness to us and just the privilege of being able to do this, to gather with good tools and lots of handouts and good things that we're going to do that very few people in the world have the opportunity of doing. Just want to lay that before you as a kind of an exhortation uh, in order to lead now to a time of prayer. And there may be on your heart uh, some urgent request right now, something that should have our attention right now that you'd like us as a class to pray about. I will do this from time to time. I want us to build a relationship. I think some of the relationships we may build may be uh, far more important than some other things that we will do. So uh, do you have anything that's right on the tip of your tongue? I'll, I'll start it off with this request for Dr. Eugene Park, who is our Vice President of Business and Financial Affairs, who has, um, let me try to pronounce it right, uh, I think it's lymphocytic, lympho lymphocytic lymphoma. Lymphoma is a form of cancer of the lymph glands, and lymphocytic lymphoma is a form of lymphoma. And uh, uh, in his particular case, he is in what is called stage four, where the, the cancer is into the bone marrow. And uh, stage five, you don't care to talk about. Uh, stage four is about a 20% chance of recovery. And uh, now, God doesn't have any tough cases and easy cases. Uh, God can raise from the dead as easily as he can cure a cold. We have no uh, disagreement about that. But I want you to know something of the nature of it. From a human perspective, it's, uh, it's, it's, from a human perspective, it's dismal. He is not dismal. And we want God's will to be done with Dr. Park. And, uh, and he just really wants to live as God would live, as our chapel said today. And he wants to use this experience in whatever way God wants it to be used. So uh, pray that if God wills, he will be marvelously restored, miraculously healed. But above and beyond that, that he will accomplish the good things through his life that God has given him this uh, trust for, and I take it as a trust. Any other special request of you? Any? Okay, let's pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, I just thank you so much for the rich privilege you've given to us to be able to study your word as your children. We have so many facilities, uh, so many assets that are ours that, that the bulk of the people in the world do not have. And Lord, I have no explanation as to why you've blessed us and have not given others the same, but I do know that I have a stewardship, a responsibility because of the good things we have. So I pray that as we start out this quarter, You'll help us to start it with a, a note of praise and thanks to you for your goodness and for what you have shared with us. And Lord, I want to especially bring before you today and in the days to come, uh, during these days as Dr. Park is receiving chemotherapy, I just want to pray for him that you will work in a marvelous way and in a miraculous way, Lord, as the great physician to heal his body, if this would be the way that you could gain the greatest glory. And Lord, if it is your will for him to carry this disease and thereby bring greater glory to you that way, I pray that you will give him patience and give him courage and let the light of Jesus Christ shine through him. Then, Father, I pray that as we uh, have this orientation session today for this course, that you will help us to cover all of the bases and that people may understand what the course is about and the direction that we're going. We may ask the questions that ought to be asked and that we may get off to a good quarter of study that we might honor you through the credible way that we handle your word 
In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let me begin with a story that hopefully will set the base for the quarter and what we're doing in this class. Over the last 20 years that I've been teaching here at Western, uh, I've also been speaking most every weekend on, uh, in some place, and very often it's in a college conference or in a college setting. And on a typical weekend, I were, a week I was down at uh, the San Jose area, speaking in a number of classes at West Valley College. And uh, one of the students who uh, professed to be an atheist uh, asked me after a class if we could get together and rap at 2 o'clock that afternoon. And uh, I said I'd be glad to do that. And we came, uh, came together at the particular place that we had designated <coughs> to rap at 2 o'clock. And uh, we got started into our discussion. And we hadn't gone very far in the discussion until uh, I felt that I ought to bring something to bear from the Word of God on what was being said. Uh, I have, you will find, that I have an insatiable desire to buttress whatever I am saying by God's Word. That does not mean that I perfectly use it, but my desire is to do nothing or say nothing uh, or depend on nothing outside of the Word of God and uh, for guiding my life. And so in our little debate, he, uh, I brought to the fore what I thought was important from Scripture, and I hadn't any more than brought it up when he responded with a very typical response. He said to me, oh, there are many different interpretations of that. And he really didn't know how angry that makes me. I don't know of anything that galls me more than for someone to have that cop out that there are many different interpretations of that. And consequently, I said, hold it, you wait right there. Earlier today, you asked me to come together with you at this place at 2 o'clock to rap with you. Now, I said, I have come here with all sincerity to rap with you, and yet I don't see any presence to rap, and I don't see any wrapping paper or ribbon with which to wrap them. Now, I frankly don't know how in the world we're going to rap without presence and without wrapping paper. <laughs> At which he said to me, uh, well, that's not what I meant. Well, I said, after all, there are many different interpretations to what you said, and this is my interpretation of what you said. Now, let's rap. <laughs> and he said, we can't even go on. I said, you're right. You're right. We cannot continue this conversation until I am willing to observe one basic rule. You didn't mean everything by what you said. You meant something. And if we're going to communicate, I've got to know what you meant by what you said. So don't tell me there are many different interpretations. There is one. And if somebody suggests 40 different interpretations, 39 of them are wrong. And maybe all 40 are wrong. Now, it's that little story that will be the burden of this whole course. Uh, I want us to understand what hermeneutics is really all about. And hermeneutics is not the name of a man by the name of Herman. Uh, hermeneutics is the science and art of interpretation. And in a later class hour, we will define that, we'll express the need for it, we'll go into a lot of detail on that. But right here at the beginning, I want to lodge that story in your mind so that we'll understand what this course is really all about. 
This course is all about finding out what that person meant by what they said. And uh, you may be wondering at this point why that should take a whole quarter. But let me suggest to you that there will not be a course that you take in all of your seminary curriculum that is more important than this one right here. And I'd say that with the whole faculty sitting right here. Because you can be a Greek expert or a Hebrew expert, and if you do not use good hermeneutics, you will only know those things to your detriment. There are plenty of people who know Greek who teach bad theology. Not because they don't know how to prove it grammatically, but because they have poor hermeneutics. So the most important thing you can do in this school is to get this course down. Now, I'm not saying that I will teach it better than anybody else. I'm simply saying there's no course you'll take that's more important. So you ought to therefore pray that I'll do a decent job of teaching it. Because if it's all that important, you surely want somebody to teach it that can handle it. Now, so much for that introduction to it. With that in mind, here's the way we will pursue the course in the course description. Number one, we've made that course description very simple. This isn't the same description you have in the catalog. Listen to it. An introduction to the principles and process of understanding the meaning of the text of Scripture and applying the significance of that, of that meaning practically and relevantly to contemporary life situations. When you read that little description, there are two things that stand out to you. Uh, you gather on the one hand that there is a procedure. There are principles and there's a procedure for understanding, but you also gather that it doesn't stop there. Because if I understood everything in the Bible perfectly and did not know how to apply it relevantly, I'd just as well not know it. Uh, so that the application end of it is just as important as the theoretical end of it, or the principles. Both of those sides are important. Now, I'm suggesting that now because as I get down to the approach to the course, you will tie the approach in with, these, with this description. In order to accomplish that, we have, Roman numeral two, some course texts. <coughs> and I'm really pleased that this year, for the first time, and I've been teaching this for 20 years now, and for the first time, I am more satisfied, really, than I have been in 20 years with the text that we have to offer. There are some good things happening in hermeneutics. And uh, we'll tell you more about some of those things in the course of the quarter. But one of the good things is uh, some textbooks uh, to be used. Now, there's an old standby that we've had for quite some time. Uh, Bernard Ram's book, Protestant Biblical Interpretation. And uh, I'm not going to explain these books now, by and large, uh, but Ram has been kind of the standard for hermeneutics. Uh, he does a good job, but unfortunately his book was without much competition. Uh, for very little was written. And you say, what a pathetic thing that such an important course should have so few books written on it. Uh, but that's been the case. We have not had the kind of books that made good textbooks for a seminary classroom. This year, two have been added, or several have been added, but I've added a couple to the course, a couple that are required. One is by Henry Verkler, simply entitled Hermeneutics, Principle and Processes of Biblical Interpretation. And the interesting thing to me is that this man is a psychologist. Uh, he has a regular seminary degree, but he is the assistant professor of psychology and director of curriculum planning and development at the Psychological Studies Institute in Atlanta. Uh, he holds his MA from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School and his PhD from Georgia State. Now it excites me when I think of a man in the field of counseling and psychology that cares about hermeneutics. Uh, that says to me that his counseling 
uh, I'm going to have a lot of respect for if he practices what he has set forth in this book. And I've been through this. It's a brand new book, and uh, it's clear and helpful, and we'll follow that very carefully during the course of the quarter. Henry Verkler's book. Just this year, we start for the first time with that. Another more technical book that we'll have as a required book is also a fairly new book, The Language and Imagery of the Bible by Caird. That's in your syllabus. And uh, this one will not read nearly as easily as uh, Verkler's book. You'll, you'll sweat a little bit with this, especially if you're not familiar with uh, uh, linguistic uh, terminology. Uh, but he will explain all of the things he gives. There will be definitions there. You may find yourself having to go back and read paragraphs over again, but uh, it, it'll be helpful in clarifying some areas that have been very vague to many people in the area of hermeneutics. Uh, so Caird's book, we probably won't read all of it, but we will read most of it, and I will assign that to you on a regular basis. A, uh, those are the three required texts, as you'll note, uh, from the syllabus. Then I have a list of 12 things that are recommended. And uh, this is only as you have opportunity to read to kind of fill your reservoir. I, I want to be fair with you. I don't want to require more from you than you can possibly do. Nor do I want to make this course be so demanding that you take time away from other courses that you ought to be given to those to do it to this course. And I realize that professors that have been teaching for a long time have the danger of doing that. They keep compounding assignments, and they forget that with the new things they add, they never took anything out. And I've already gone through that uh, purging a couple of years ago. So I, I, I want to be fair with you, and that's why most of these things are under the recommended list. I want you to know about them if you have a chance to go and read them. For example, the first two recommended texts, uh, are by Hirsch. Hirsch is not a seminarian. He is a professor of English at the University of Virginia. And uh, his first book, Validity in Interpretation, takes us a long ways in interacting with this problem of uh, multiple meanings of a text that has become so prominent in uh, English lit courses today, especially as precipitated by T.S. Eliot. And the tendency to say, uh, it isn't important what the text means, what's important is what does it mean to you. And that sounds very practical, but it's absolutely devastating. And uh, Hirsch's first book uh, was uh, helpful his second book, Aims in Interpretation, I think uh, expands an area that was found to be kind of a loophole in the first book. And uh, it, it comes to the fore for some of us that there's a little weakness here that we want to try to handle. And probably Hirsch wants to handle it because he has honest intention of helping us in talking about a big area called authorial intention. Authorial intention is a, is a technical term for getting at the meaning of the author. What did the author mean by what he said? Authorial intention. So those are two books that you will hear talked about a lot. And if your reading schedule allows you a little more time than some others, you'd want to move through those books. Uh, you would be better off for having done it. Uh, Ralph Eisensee, the third book mentioned, is simp these are simply in alphabetical order, and it is totally different. It, it is a, uh, a product from one of our Doctor of Ministry students uh, that was done for a lay person in uh, discovering the Bible. He took uh, a little syllabus of mine and uh, expanded that in a way that it could be used for the lay person. And uh, this book is helpful in that. Uh, as I move along in your assignment, uh, you may find that this particular book will help you in helping the students that you will be teaching. That's a little clue here in case you were not aware of that yet uh, under the 
process you will be teaching. And so uh, this book, you might just mark that down, would fill in a lot of information to help you in what you would teach those students. Ralph Eisenstein's book, Discovering the Bible, a practical uh, work. P.D. Jewell, just exactly the opposite of Eisenstein, is a very technical work. Professor of German at Princeton, this book is Interpretation, an Essay in the Philosophy of Literary Criticism. Very heavy. I have to work hard to handle it. And, uh, but some of you people that are pretty sharp uh, can uh, uh, put this alongside of Hirsch and uh, find maybe some, uh, mm, some helpfulness beyond Hirsch. Uh, he is thoroughly familiar with Hirsch and respects him and has profited by him, but he says some, some things in his book on interpretation that may close up some of the loopholes in Hirsch's book. Of all the books that I'm talking about here, this one probably is the most specific in getting at the heart of the problem of authorial intention. How do I know what the writer means by what he says? I. Howard Marshall uh, edits the book called New Testament Interpretation. He also writes one of the chapters in it, which is one of the more helpful chapters of the book. But this symposium covers just a wealth of areas of interest. I would suggest you check it out from the library. Uh, it'll be on reserve. And look down through the table of contents, and uh, you will find some areas that maybe have been bugging you. Maybe you've heard the term the new hermeneutic used from modern theology. Well, Thistleton does a chapter in here on that. Or maybe you're wondering about demythologizing. They've got a chapter here. That's the liberal approach to myth, and you need to look at that. <coughs> Many redaction criticism, source criticism, form criticism, tradition history, uh, those kinds of things, historical criticism, a chapter on each of those. And I. Howard Marshall is a strong evangelical, and it slips me now, I think he's from the University of Aberdeen. Uh, do you remember, Cliff? I believe so, uh, from England. A very recent book that has come out that deals with the modern problem. Let me skip ahead to this one and then I'll come back in the order there. Is a book called The Two Horizons by Thistleton. Remember I said that one of the chapters in here was by Thistleton from England. And uh, this whole book is by Thistleton. This is probably the heaviest of all the books I've got here. Uh, but it is the most up-to-date and people that are that are uh, up to date on the hermeneutical problems today, uh, it's, all, it's expected that they will have read Thistleton. If they haven't read it, you aren't up to date in, in the heart of the problems. Won't help you a great deal on the practical level, but it does get at some of the uh, more difficult philosophical problems that are being uh, bandied about today in the area of hermeneutics. At times you will think, boy, that's unimportant. Good grief, all we want to do is, is speak the word. See? And that'll frustrate you. It frustrates me. Uh, and a student in a meeting the other day asked me, he said, if, if the Bible is so tough to understand, uh, why in the world do we even bother to, to tell the layman that he can get at the text? And I, my only explanation to that is that it's not that the Bible is so tough to understand. It's that we have poured so much garbage on top of it over the centuries that it's really tough to find a pitchfork and durable enough to get under that and get down to what the Bible means by what it says. Why? Because everybody under the sun, cult or not, wants to use the Bible to teach what they already believe because it has inherent authority. So if they can quote the Bible, they will do it. And in so doing, abuse many principles. And therefore, we have to work hard at clarifying the principles. You'll see some other names there. Earl Rodmacher, uh, a set of tapes on understanding the Bible. For those of you that spend a lot of time on the road, uh, I have summarized this course in eight lectures on tape. If you want to get ahead of me, uh, you can get the tapes. Uh, called Understanding the Bible, 
and uh, I basically go through the gist of what I will teach in this course there, and uh, this will also be helpful uh, for preparing for the classes you will teach in hermeneutics and for the students that you might have. I would say that what Ralph Eisensee has done in discovering a Bible and uh, what I have done here, these would complement one another and they may prove to be helpful to you. The book on understanding contemporary dispensationalism uh, is not really a book so much as an unfinished manuscript. I did this at one time thinking I would write a book there and then another writer I found at the same time was completing the book and I thought he would solve the problems that I was getting at. He completed it and, uh, and certainly worked at the same problems, but I'm not sure that, I, that, uh, that they're answered yet. And someday I will go on to finish this, but this short manuscript gives three basic principles uh, that are a part of this system called dispensationalism. For some people, that's a dirty word, and I'd like to, to help to clean it up if that's the, the case with you. So uh, that's another book available. James Sire, I don't have a copy of that with me here, called Scripture Twisting. You'll find that full of good examples. Paul Lee Tan, in the book, The Interpretation of Prophecy, there he is setting forth principles of hermeneutics, and he is zeroing in on the area of prophecy particularly. Anthony Thistleton, I already mentioned, and then finally, A.A. A. Van Ruler, The Christian Church and the Old Testament. The reason I put this book before you is because one of the greatest problems with regard to allegorizing or spiritualizing relates to Israel and the church. And I thought it would be fair for me as a, uh, a kind of reformed dispensationalist to put before you a book by a rock-ribbed reformed theologian. You couldn't get more reformed than Amsterdam. And uh, so he is coming from that perspective of covenant theology, and he is speaking uh, of some of the failures in interpretation in this matter of Israel and the church and a part of reformed theology. In other words, he's looking from his own camp. And so what I'm trying to do here is clean up some of the uh, abuses and misunderstandings in the area of dispensationalism. What he's trying to do here is clean up some of that same thing from Reformed theology, theology and raise some questions. And so that would be a help for some of you. Okay? Those are the books. Any question there? No, I'm doing... Whoops. I was going. Did I not mention that? I'm yeah. sorry. Uh, Walt Kaiser will not be a required book, though I'd like to have you read it like a required book. Uh, he was the professor of uh, Verkler. And uh, Walt Kaiser is writing all kinds of good things in the area of hermeneutics. And uh, this book, Toward an Exegetical Theology, though it gets heavy at times, is very plain, very clear. And there will be sometimes I will assign portions of it, but not all of it. I realize that you can't do everything. So uh, that's an excellent book. I can't say enough good about it. Excellent. Now, third, course objectives. Very simply, two things. When I'm trying to talk about what the objectives should, should be, I thought, well, let's, uh, let's do it from the Bible. 2 Timothy 2.15, 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. First of all, you might have the academic goal, and secondly, the practical goal. The academic goal, I want to master the procedure for understanding the Bible. That's what I want to do in the course. I want you to master the procedure for understanding what the Bible means by what it says. So at any time, if somebody is going astray in interpretation, you'll be able to spot the area where they got off or the area where you got off. Secondly, it would not do any good to be able to do all of that if you didn't know how to apply it and teach it to somebody else. So the second objective, each student will teach others to accom accomplish objective number one. And I've quoted 2 Timothy 2.2 2 there. That which you have received, commit to others who shall be able to teach others also. So the basis for my objectives for the course are very biblical. Now the course grading ties in with that too. 50% of the grade will be on the first objective and 50% will be on the second objective. That's fair, isn't it? Uh, so 50% will be on how well you master the material, 
that you get in the class, and 50% will be on how well the students you teach master the material that you taught them. All right? In other words, uh, well, let's just go on. This gets better as we go along. Uh, Roman numeral five, the course approach. The course approach, let me just read that. The course will be obedience oriented. I believe that every basic thing we learn ought to have a commensurate obedience. That is, cognitive input will be measured in terms of practical performance. Uh, to learn to do something, it's necessary to practice it. If you want to ride a horse, climb a mountain, build a boat, write a novel, a certain amount of instruction in a class in the subject will be useful. After that, you'll need to get a horse, start climbing, riding, so forth, on your own. Otherwise, you will have not learned what you need to know, that is, how in fact to do the thing you have set out to learn to do. One learns nothing so well as when he passes it on to another. The obedience-oriented approach will encourage you to digest the cognitive class materials, knead it into communicable terms, and pass it on to your disciples. You will learn how to interpret the Bible accurately, and you will teach others how to do the same. That's the course, 50% on each part of that. If you only get one part of it, you can obviously see the consequences. You have failed the course. Uh, and you can always take it again. Roman numeral six, course <laughs> assignment. First, the practical project. Number one, you are to teach the material contained in this course to a class consisting of not less than three persons of your choice. I would suggest senior high school or above. There are some avant-garde junior high schoolers, but I think you'll do better with senior high or above. Choose your students well. Faithfulness may be better than smartness. Uh, so you are to teach the material that you get from this course to them, all right? Secondly, you will teach five bi-weekly sessions. We will be teaching 10 weeks here. You'll be teaching five bi-weekly sessions, passing on to your students the principles you have learned in T500 during the previous two weeks. I'll teach for two weeks. You'll summarize those two weeks, and you'll teach the summary to your students. They won't be able to digest as much as you can digest. I hopefully will know more about the subject than you know, but I won't give you everything I know. And out of what I know, I will give some to you, and you will take out of what you know and give some to them on down the line. You will be required to turn in a lesson plan and a class evaluation every other Tuesday after you have taught your own class. And on Appendix 1, if you just turn over a sheet, you have the lineup for the five lesson plans, the dates that they're due, and some statements about those lesson plans. You'll want to read that through carefully. There's a minimum, number of, uh, minimum amount of verbiage there, but what is there you need to understand. If you've never taught a course and you don't know what a lesson plan is, I have here for you, you can uh, distribute these, a sample lesson plan. And this is not the absolute at all, but uh, it gives you a guideline. If you've got a better one, fine. Some, some of the elementary ed majors turned in super lesson plans. And if you know somebody in class that's got their degree in education, you might want to tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, I don't know a thing about a lesson plan. Will you help me? Uh, so, whatever, there's a sample lesson plan. Also, I have a little syllabus that I have put together from time to time, uh, entitled, I Wish I Knew the Bible Better. If you want to use this syllabus for your students as a, an outline, I will not consider that plagiarism. You can feel free to go ahead and do that. You might want to tell them it isn't your own, but uh, uh, that's something to get you started. If it helps, fine. If you don't want to go that route, fine. Uh, you have latitude there. But there you have a sample outline and a sample lesson plan. That will be 50% of your project. Secondly, in course assignments, there will be scripture memorization. And I'm sorry, I'm moving a little rapidly here. Try to get through this. There will be scripture memorization. I have the passages, the four passages I want you to memorize. I have the due date for them. And then you've got the time at which they were completed, whether they were completed on time or late. And then if they were not completed, then put the incomplete there, mark the incomplete. I feel strongly about hiding the word of God in your heart. You never get beyond that. And if you think scripture memorization is for little kids, you're fooling yourself. 
Uh, scripture memorization is for everybody. If you have not yet memorized the whole Bible, then scripture memorization is for you. <laughs> so we're going to help you by making it a part of this course. Uh, so there are four key passages that have a lot to do with the subject matter we're talking about. That's lined up for you there, so there should not be a problem. And then uh, capital C, required reading. The assigned readings must be completed prior to class. And there's no use trying to fudge on that. You know, don't come and read while I'm teaching. That insults me. Uh, and you don't want to make me mad. So uh, don't come and read your text in class to get it. It must be read before you come to class, not during class. So uh, let's just, you know, have a commitment to one another. Give me a couple more minutes, will you? On the testing, very simply here, there will be weekly quizzes to be expected. You may not get them, but be ready for them over what I have said in the class and over what has been said in the reading material for that day. Uh, questions will come from both. Uh, secondly, there will not be a midterm exam. I don't want to wipe you out. We've given you a lot of other things. And so these uh, lesson plans that you hand in and the uh, evaluations of your teaching and all of that will be in lieu of a mid-semester exam to prepare for. We will have the weekly quizzes. Then there will be a final that will be administered during the final exam week to test your mastery of the first objective of the course. I will give you an exam to give to your students at the end of the course, and the average grade that they get on the exam that I give to you to give to them will be half of your grade. You got that down? Now, that will mean that you will be very interested in how well your students do, right? Uh, so it will not be an academic exercise for you. You want the, your students to succeed in interpretation. Now, some of you are going to say, hey, prof, could I grade you that way? <laughs> no, not for this occasion, at least. That will come in years to come, perhaps. But uh, uh, we want to make it really practical. So choose your students. Be sure they can understand. And 50% uh, of the course grade will be on what you do in the class, and 50% will be what you do out there. Yes. Every day. I wanted to keep the reading schedule flexible. I haven't done that in the past, but I may be getting way beyond you, and I don't want to just have you under the pile. So daily, I will, re I will assign it.